Go ahead and get out your literature books, but don't open them yet. We're first going to have some review over the poem that we studied last class, Paul Lawrence Dunbar's Sympathy. The first thing that I want us to do is discuss the bird as a symbol um, in that poem. What do you think for that one, Lily? Traditionally, birds are symbols of freedom, but a birds in a cage is in bondage and unable to be free. Very good. So when we have that bird symbol, typically in literature, we think of it as being something that um, can fly, can be free. It's that symbol of freedom. But when we take that same bird and put it in a cage, the simile is that much more effective. Next, I want you to explain the effectiveness of the simile in line four. Sam? The simile is effective because it paints a vivid picture of pure, clean water that is flowing smoothly and reflecting light. Exactly right. In that simile, in line four, we see that picture of the river of glass, and that's a really effective picture, really effective imagery for us. Finally, what is the theme of the poem, Liv? Um, the theme of this poem is the same as its name, sympathy. To feel sympathy is to be able to put yourself in another person's place and feel what you feel, feeling. Exactly right, and as we continue this unit on the compassionate heart, we're gonna be seeing that same kind of sympathy in our lesson for today. Have you ever gone to a place such as a third world country, and seeing people who lived very differently from the way that you lived. Maybe seeing people who lived more impoverished circumstances made you think about how many people worldwide live with physical need. While we need to realize that people have physical need, we also need to realize that they have spiritual needs as well. Perhaps someday the Lord will call you to meet such a need through the work of missions. Before we get into our lesson for today, I do want to introduce you to one person who did participate in such mission work. Go ahead and look on page 193 and follow along with me as I highlight some key characteristics about our author of the frill, Pearl S. Buck. So Pearl S. Buck grew up in China as the daughter of missionaries. And as the daughter of missionaries, she had the chance to visit a lot of different Eastern countries. Accordingly, a lot of her works, her short stories, her novels, her essays take place in the East. Something you may have noticed in your reading for today was that there was the use of Pidgin English. Now, Pidgin English is kind of a halfway language that omits articles between English and Chinese. This is something that we see the Taylor and Mrs. Um, Lo being able to communicate between each other using. Something else you need to know about Pearl S. Buck is she was the first woman to win both the Pulitzer and Nobel Prizes. She won the Pulitzer Prize for Literature for her story the good earth. And what really is significant about Pearl S. Buck, the reason that we study her, is that she shows us the other side of life. She shows circumstances, just like good literature does, that's different from the way that we live, and we can learn something about the greater struggle of the human um, culture through her writings. Go ahead and turn to page 188, and we're going to get into this story. When you think about this story, The Frill, I want you to think about the struggle between two characters. We have the tailor and we have Mrs. Lowe. The tailor is bringing this dress to Mrs. Lowe and she has different demands for this dress. He's just trying to support his family and those around him, but she is repeatedly rude and unkind to him. Really, the setting for this story provides such a struggle. We have a Chinese port town during colonial expansion, but we also have the contrast between the tailor and then Mrs. Lowe's house as well. How would you describe the tone of this story? Olivia. Uh, the tone is tense and gloomy as the tailor is desperate to make enough money to take care of his family. That's exactly right. We have this tense and desperate tone which is created by the terrible circumstances that the tailor finds himself in. But creates such a desperate tone also by contrasting her two key characters. We're going to see Mrs. Lowe and then the tailor as well. When you think about that name, Mrs. Lowe, what does her name tell you about Mrs. Lowe as a person? What do you think, Sam? That she's a low person? Yeah, that's, really, that's correct. So we have Mrs. Lowe's name. It's satirical. But we also have a description of her character that makes us dislike her. If you look at page 188, at the top of the page, we have these first two paragraphs starting with my dear. Go ahead and read those for us, Lowe. My dear, the only way to manage these anti railers is to be firm. Miss, Mrs. Lowe, the postmaster's wife, settled herself with some difficulty into the wicker rocking chair upon the wide veranda of her house. She was a large woman, red-faced with more food than necessary, and a little exercise over the ten odd years she had spent in a port town on the chi China coast. And now she looked and, and now she looked at her, called, and thus spoke, her square, hard flesh face grew a little redder. So we have this description of Mrs. Lowe, and it really makes us dislike her. 
Go ahead and look at the top of page 188. We have this line that she says, the only way to manage these negative tailors is to be firm. I want you to underscore these lines because we're gonna be seeing these repeated throughout the story. So Mrs. Lowe is described as red-faced and hard-fleshed. Our other key character is the tailor. If you look at the top of page 188 in the second column, we have the tailor described as tall and very clean. So really, Buck juxtaposes these two characters through their descriptions. We also see a comparison on page 189 in the second column, second paragraph from the top. His voice dropped yet lower. My brother's son, he died today, I think. He had three-piece baby, one woman, no money by coffin, no nothing. He very ill today. If you see in these lines, we have that pigeon English being used. But as we look into what Mrs. Lowe responds with, we see that she's not using the pigeon language that we know that she's been using previously. Mrs. Lowe looked at her collar. Well, of all the nerve. Here, Mrs. Lowe isn't using the pigeon English with him because she's talking about him right in front of him to Mrs. Newman. In these lines, we see that while Mrs. Lowe is rude and selfish, the tailor is respectful and kind. The tailor asks for money so that he can buy a coffin for his nephew. But Mrs. Lowe insults him and will not give to him the money to share with those around him. I want you to go ahead and turn to page 190. We're going to see a further progression of how this tailor is characterized. If you look in the second column, the tailor has left from Mrs. Lowe's house and he's going to visit his nephew who's suffering from a burned leg. If you look in the second column on page 190, second paragraph, I'm going to start reading with the tailor. The tailor turned down an alleyway and into a door in a wall. He passed through a court filled with naked children screaming and quarreling and shouting at play. Above his head were stretched bamboo poles upon which were hung ragged garments washed in too scanty water and without any soap. Here about these courts, a family lived in every room and poured its waste into the court, so that even though it was a dry day and the day had been dry for a moon or more, yet the court was slimy and running with wastewater. When we see this description against the description of Mrs. Lowe's house, we see what squalor and terrible living conditions the nephew and his children are living in. The tailor, he waits by the bedside of his dying nephew all day long, promising to take care of the children when he can hardly take care of himself. After the nephew dies, he goes home and works all night to get this frill ready for Mrs. Lowe. In the last comparison, we're going to see that Mrs. Lowe is dishonest, but the tailor is self-sacrificing. Go to page 193 in your books. Um, I want us to look at the very last paragraph, starting with there the frill lay in the second column on page 193. Go ahead and read that for us, Sam. There the frill lay, beautifully pleated, perfectly ironed. She said with satisfaction, yes, is it nice, isn't it? I'm so glad that I've decided to have the frill after all. And so cheap, my dear. With all this frill, the dress costs only $5 to be made. That's less than $2 at home. What's that? Oh, yes. He brought it punctually at 12, as I told him he must. It's as I said, you simply have to be firm with these native tailors. Thank you, good reading. In this excerpt, we see right after Mrs. Lowe had just ridiculed the tailor's work. She was dishonest about requesting the frill in the first place. She's unkind, she's self-serving. Even in the midst of all these terrible things that we see in the story, there are some takeaways that we can still think about as it relates to this story. There is meaning, and the theme is selfishness and insensitivity as it relates to colonial expansion. Even though Mrs. Lowe is someone who's a guest in this country, she is still unkind, she's selfish, she looks after her own interests instead of those around her. She treats the Chinese people as if she's better than they are, and we should never act like that if we are people um, traveling to another country. We also see beauty in this story, though. Even though the, the tailor has very little, he's willing to share what little he has with those around him. The final takeaway that I want you to think about as it relates to this story is that anyone can share God's love through the way that he treats others. Even though we don't see any mention of God or Christianity in this story, if we think about those two contrasted characters, Mrs. Lowe and the tailor, which one showed God's love better? Well, it would have been the tailor. He shared what little he had with others and cared about the needs of those around him. I like to think about this verse in Job 29, 14. I put on righteousness and it clothed me. My judgment was as a robe and a diadem. 
When Mrs. Loeb put on the garment with the frill, she was putting on with that garment, avarice, greed, self-serving. But the tailor, he was clothed with righteousness. I like to think about that verse in Proverbs 31, that strength and beauty is her clothing. I want strength and beauty and righteousness to be my clothing. So think about that when you're getting dressed. By way of review, um, I first want to ask, what is Mrs. Lowe's character like? What do you think, Liv? She's full of her own self-importance and has no compassion. Exactly right. And then how does the author develop our sympathy for the tailor, Sam? By describing the grim living conditions of the family and showing the tailor's diligence. Correct. And then what is the theme of the story, Liv? The theme involves selfishness and insensitivity, especially relating to colonial expansion. Very good. You can put away your literature books and get out your assignment pad. Today's homework is going to be grammar and composition, page 141, exercise C, and page 142, exercise number 6 through 10. In world literature, I want you to read pages 194 through 196, and then answer the study questions 1 and 4 on page 194. Thank you for your attention, and you are dismissed.